G'day guys, how are we going? Well, here we are for already a few of you having a bit of a yarn and um, a bit of a yarn before this uh, live chat gets started. But um, tonight's going to be uh, a bit of a chat about, and I'm sure someone will let me go, make sure this is all coming through. But um, after doing that drive up Billy Gate Bluff truck there a few weeks ago, which was a cracking day out and a good bit of fun, and the old track, yeah, it's certainly in a bit of, bit of condition at the moment. Loud and clear, good on your Biggles. Thanks very much. Greatly appreciate you guys all dropping in there, nice and early. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have a bit of a chat about this because there's a lot of questions came through from that video that I loaded there. So I thought, well, let's have a bit of a bit of a debrief, if you like, about um, Billy Gay Bluff Track, and then that way, you know, we can um, answer some of those questions that people have asked, which I've got a list of them sitting over the side over here, and then we'll be able to maybe answer some of the ones that you guys might have. Um, for any additional questions you might have if you're contemplating looking at driving Billy Goat Bluff Track in any time soon. So we'll get into this. Now, I'm going to break this up into two sections. Now, the two sections of Billy Goat Bluff Track, it's from the bottom coming up when you're driving up it. We're going to take it from the bottom up to the helipad, and then we're going to take it from the helipad up to the bluff is where really all the action begins, I suppose, in that section. Um, now, good old Billy Goat Bluff Track. Now, it's um, it going by the maps that I've got of rooftop maps. It says that it climbs 1.2 kilometers in elevation in just seven k's. So, you know, it gives you a bit of an indication as to how steep and this track is in over a short sort of period of time. It's not seven k's; it isn't a really long track for the elevation that it gets. So, this is why you know a lot of people they do want to drive this Billy Goat Bluff Track. It's a very iconic track. Uh, in the Victorian high country and particularly around that Dargo area as well. A lot of people just want to drive this track, but um, it's one of these tracks that, you know, you need to certainly take with an absolute great deal of respect and never, ever take this track for granted. Um, you just never know what it's going to throw of you, but it's getting a fair bit of social media attention at the minute. And this is one reason why I thought I wanted to go and have a bit of a look and just see what's going on with it. So let's get into it. And good to see a few guys. Mark's on here early. We don't want chat about Mark about his drowning his patrol today, but I'm sure he'll get into that a bit later on. Um, so yeah, so from the bottom, we're going to start from the bottom going up as I did in the video, and we're going to get to the helipad. Now, this section here, um, there is a few decent steep climbs in it, um, but it is quite rutted and chewed up, a few wombat holes, you know, those cross up sort of thing in that first section leading up to that sharp sort of right hairpin bend. But this section, I've certainly seen it worse than what it is at the moment. Um, it's just a really good drive, but probably a couple of steep sections as you're heading up, you do that sharp right-hander, you drive along a little bit, and then there's a sharp left-hander, and it climbs really steeply from that point on. So that's probably one of the points there where, yeah, you've got to be a little bit careful of it in that section there. Sort of flattens out, and then it goes again. There's sort of two or three sort of reasonably steep climbs up to the helipad, which, you know, I got through the helipad, no worries at all, but thing is you've got to take into account and got to look at here is when someone says, you know, they're getting through it pretty easy, well, it all do, also comes down to what sort of driving experience you've had in off-road conditions in steep country like this one. And that's certainly what it comes down to. So you've got to weigh it up yourself as to what experience you've done and how well your setup is in your full drive and how well you sort of know your full drive because, um, you know, in the day your full drive only going to do where what you do with it and the lines you pick and and that sort of thing as to whether it's going to get up okay. So that's getting to the helipad. Yeah, pretty comfortable getting up to there. Pretty much no dramas. Now, as I've mentioned a few times, and I mentioned it certainly in this video here, that when you get to that helipad, if you've um, found the drive up from the bottom to the helipad, not really, you know, you haven't found it really comfortable and you've had some challenging sections there in some of those steep up sections, and you're not really feeling too confident about after doing that that section of the track up the helipad. Well, this is serious to the point where you've got to weigh it up whether you go on or whether you turn around and go back and come back another day. Because once you go past this helipad, you'll drop off the top of the helipad, as you'll see in the video. You drop off the helipad, it flattens out for a little bit. But then once that climb begins, you're now at the point of no return. There's no coming back once you start that final climb all the way to the bluff. And it is a fairly reasonable length of climb to get up to the top there. But this is where it all begins in Billy Gate Bluff Track. It's generally always this section between the helipad and the bluff is where it, if it's going to get chopped up, it's generally always this section. 
Um, and this is where it certainly is. And um, I think I've may have seen a little bit worse than what it is at the moment, but geez, feeding him, it's up there uh, for being pretty bad at the moment. There's a lot of um, rocky rock ledges, some loose rocks, but big, you know, big, big lumpy rock sections and, and those sort of things, which you've got to get yourself up and over um, and, you know, challenge up these sections. And another thing I'm also going to talk about too is, is as I mentioned in that video, that we had to stop and um, help one of these guys, a solo traveller, um, which I'll get into that a little bit um, into this as we get going and I'll let you know about his situation and what happened with him because not ideal. But, you know, Billy Gate Bluff Track's one of those tracks that you really shouldn't drive it by yourself and especially on your own, like now, um, the way it is at the moment, really not ideal. I certainly wouldn't drive it by myself at the moment after, after seeing it there the other week. Um, it's pretty full on. And, um, you know, there has been a number of rollovers on Billy Gate Bluff Track in probably the last sort of four to six months. I think there's about three, could even be four, maybe rollovers on this track and on this section between the helipad and the bluff is where it all goes on. If it's going to happen, where it's going to turn nasty, it's always in that section. And this guy that we came across, um, he was in that section. So we're heading up and we've come, come just about come around one of these corners here to start this next section. And the guys in front of me, because I was with two other vehicles at the time and they were in front of me at the time. And then all of a sudden a message comes out of the radio that we've, um, we've got a guy in trouble up here. And as soon as someone mentions that on this track that, you know, we've got someone in trouble, it's never going to be great. It's um, always going to be someone in a, in a fair bit of strife. It's going to need a, a reason with a hand and generally going to be in a fair bit of trouble. And, and we got up there and yeah, this guy was um really long long steep section long way still to go really steep rough rugged section he was in trouble with and what was going on with this guy he was in a i think it was a colorado dual cab or something like that i think he was driving um but he said every time you know he was going up these steep sections the engine would just cut out and it sounded like fuel issues and that's what he was saying that sometimes with his vehicle this is what goes on that the fuel pump's not strong enough to pump fuel up to the motor. So the engine just cuts out all the time and it kept starting and then it'd go and try and drive off and the engine would cut out. So he was in a fair bit of strife there. And um, so what he ended up doing before we got to him, he just wanted to get his vehicle as secure as he could, which wasn't certainly secure when we got to it. So he's rolled it back Um and leaned it up against this gum tree, right? He's dropped, rolled it back, and he's completely right angles across the track now. So it was on a really nasty angle, really rugged section of the track. He's on a really nasty angle, and he's backed his tray into this gum tree that's probably only oh, 10 centimetres round. It wasn't much of a gum tree at all. And seriously, the only thing stopping him from going over was that gum tree because where he was, the, the back right-hand tyre was still going up a bit of an incline on, on the side of the track there. And there was still a little bit to go before that back wheel probably was potentially going to drop over that incline. And the only thing stopping him, because as he was going to come up, then the, the left-hand side was going to keep sort of getting more weight on it, more weight on it, and then dropping a lot of weight on that left-hand side. So the only thing stop him, stopped him from going over was the fact he was leaning up against that gum tree. Because when we got there, he had his tyre pressures let down, which, yeah, that's a good thing, let your tyre pressures down. Um, but there was, my God, there was a stack of, stack of weight, stack of pressure on that front left. It was almost popping off off the rim. Um, there was that much weight on that front left um, where the way he had it parked up. So what we ended up doing with him, lucky, you know, he was able to start his engine again. And he had a winch on the front of his vehicle, which is a good thing. So we used his winch to get him straightened back up. We hooked it up to a tree, you know, a little bit up the track. We winched him up the track just to get him straightened up. And then we winched him back into one of these sort of washaways, you know, the big washaways on the side of the track there. Heaps of room there to get a vehicle into. So we winched him back in there on the winch. So we got him backwards on the winch into there and um, got him all safe and secure there. But the thing, the other thing he'd also gone and done, he'd also done a hub as well. So um, lucky enough, he had a spare hub to fix it. Um, now, we gave him all sorts of options to, you know, the recovery mobs to come and get him i think it's admiral one of the big ones there in the high country we gave him the numbers there to come and get him because there was no way knowing one of us was still going to be able to tow him um that unassisted to get him out from where he was still a long way to go and mighty rugged country rugged section of track still to get out before um he was going to be up the top and and that's what sort of happened to this guy so you know his this was almost rollover number four or number five in a very very short space of time and if it wasn't for that tree that he, he leaned the back corner up against he was probably gone. Um, so, yeah, 
And and because of where it was, it was at right angles on the track, and it wouldn't have just rolled over its side. It would have potentially rolled like you know log roll over log. It would have gone probably maybe another four or five times at the, to, before it got to the bottom, which yeah would have been really really nasty situation for this guy. But anyway, we we got him all safe and secured. And uh, when we came back down, because we came back down, Billy, uh, we'd been to the top. We came back down the same way, and he was still there. So we had a bit of a yarn to him, and he said, look, I've, uh, he's managed to change that hub, so he's changed the hub over after busting that. And uh, then, uh, yeah, he was going to try and drive it back down and and um, and get it back down, down down the track that way. And we're not running in, into him back in Dargo later on. And, um, yeah, so he got himself back down all right. Um, with another group that had certainly come through. And, uh, yeah, that's where that guy was very lucky. But um, so that's sort of one thing, yeah, I've, I've certainly certainly got there, and that's that helipad, Fenningham. If you're not comfortable getting to that helipad, if you come up the bottom, seriously highly recommend don't go on any further because it doesn't get any easier from that section on. It only gets worse um, and a lot worse. And as I say, once you start that final climb um, up to the bluff, you are 100% committed to um, getting to the top. And, uh, yeah, so that's that one. And then, you know, people ask, you know, which way is better? Is it better to go up or better to go down? Well, I don't really think there's a there's a better way at the moment. They're both pretty pretty challenging. doesn't matter where you're going up or whether you're going down. But the thing with going up at the moment, and, again, we'll focus now on between the helipad and the bluff because this is the really worst section of it. Um, when you're going up, you don't have a lot of time to – be thinking about looking up the track and seeing what's coming up ahead because you're just on the go all the time and there's there's some sections there where they're good you know two three four meters long of rough challenging you know sections and you don't want to ever come to a stop on some of these because they'd be pretty hard to get going again so you don't have a lot of time and this re this can also reply to you know a lot of tracks in Victorian night country not just billy goat but going up any sort of steep nasty tracks like that you don't have a lot of time to, to think about what's coming up. You've got to be on the ball. You've got to be looking for your pick, trying to pick your lines, maybe have a bit of a quick look up the track to maybe see what's coming up before you've got to get your eyes back down in front of the bonnet again and and uh, see what's, you know, what you've got to deal with right in front of you. So that's the only thing there with with going up up tracks is, yeah, you're on it all the time. You don't have a lot of, lot of time to think about it. Whereas coming down, you know, it can be just as challenging. The only thing you've got on your side is because you're coming down, you've now got gravity on your side, which can work against you too, but you now you've got gravity on your side and, um, you know, you can very easily get in trouble coming down, especially if you got get crossed up on one of these nasty sections. Um, yeah, rollovers can happen very, very easily on that track at the moment. If you get it all wrong in some of those sections, that's where gravity is going to be one of your enemies because it's going to help you you know, go down a bit quicker than what you really, really want. So there's no real easy way at the moment. Um, it's one of those tracks you're going to have to certainly take a bit to think about and certainly don't do it on your own. You know, if you're going to go, if you're a bit not sure at the moment, make sure you go with some confident people um, and have a go with them and at least if, you know, you do get in a bit of strife, well, at least there's going to be some people there to maybe give you a bit of a hand out. Um, the other thing too is, you know, don't drive this track in the heat of the day. You know, we're now starting to come into summertime and I've seen this time and time again. Um, you know, I've camped at Talbotville many times and, and you know, you do Billy Goat for, a, you know, for a day trip, might go up to the Pinnacles, have some lunch and come back down. And I've seen it time and time again where people are driving this track in the late afternoon. So, you know, you've got the peak, of it, it could be 30 odd plus degrees. And you're doing these long, steep climbs, work, engines working really hard, scream its head off, not much airflow going through the engine. And it's really off, you know, quite often you can see vehicles overheating on this track. So, you know, think about that. Think about the time of day that you're going to go and take it on and get it done, you know, if you can, get it done in mid morning before lunch or at least not long after lunch. Get it done, at least get to the top. Coming down is not quite so bad. Um, you know, so you can take your time, but going up your engine and your vehicle is working at maximum. So try not to do it in the peak of the day in those hot, hot days, that's for sure. Now, the other thing with recovery gear is um make sure you've got that handy. You know, I've I've mentioned a few times with my recovery gear, I keep it in a bag and it's on the floor in the front seat in the passenger seat. So really, really handy to get to, really, really easy to get to if I need to. And if I don't can't get to it. Like I said, I was with um, a few mates there the other day. Very easy for them to get to. You know, they could just go open the door and bang straps, whatever else we needed. We're always right there. So really handy 
to have your your winch gear and you know your recovery gear straps and that all really handy just in case because if you keep them like in the in your drawers in the back and you know you're in a steep section and you know you've got to get your recovery straps out of your drawers in the back you go and open your back of your four drive out your drawers are like they could you know under the weight all slide out and then you know you're in all sorts of dramas or you know you're coming down a steep section you've got to get a strap out of something like that Again, you've got to open your barn doors and you've got to try and drag out a big heavy drawer, you know, while you're on a steep uphill section. So even if they are in your drawers, you know, put your snatch strap or whatever winch gear you get, maybe put that somewhere where it's handy. Get it out of your drawers in the back and put it on the floor or, or something like that or in a bag or something on the floor where it's a bit easier to get to just in case those times we might need it. Because, um, yeah, she's a pretty nasty track and you just never know what it's going to throw at you at this whole track. It's pretty, pretty good at the moment. Now... I see what some of you guys are saying here. Too many cowboys saying the track is easy. Look, mate, I can't can't agree with you so much there. It drives me nuts when you see people, though. I've seen a lot of comments on this where they say, oh, it's like a highway, it's a piece of cake at the moment. Um, it does my feeling I'm heading when I read these sort of comments. Billy Gate Bluff Track doesn't matter what sort of condition it is, whether it's like now or years before when I've seen it. Yeah, quite easy. Even, you know, even the steep section between the helipad and the bluff. I've seen a lot easier than what it is at the moment. And, you know, and everyone's still, they, you know, you still get people oh, described as a highway. Well, it's never a bloody highway. And, um, you know, and as soon as someone reads that, whether they're, you know, might be a bit inexperienced and thinking about doing it and they say, oh, this bloke says it's like a highway, it must be all right. So they go off there and they drive it and they get themselves into trouble. So never, ever describe, underrate this track. Um, it is always to be maybe taken as a great deal of respect, never ever take for granted because you just never know what it's going to fit in and throw at you this track. And there's plenty of them like this in our country, not just Billy Goat. There's a lot of them, but but this one's one of the big iconic ones that between this and Blue Rag and Dago area, they're the two number one tracks that people want to drive. And I see why they want to drive them, you know, magnificent views at the top. Uh, it's a good challenge. Both of them are good challenging drive, but, um, yeah, they're just, um, yeah, never underrate these tracks, that's for sure. Um, have you thought about upgrading? Have I ever thought about upgrading to a Ranger? There's no chance I'm upgrading to a Ranger there, there Ron. Um, that is for sure. Sounds like uh, it's a lot worse than when I was up there. A uh, little bit of um, bit of snow at the top in April 21. Oh, April 21, it's nothing like that. I did it just before COVID. Was probably about, I've probably done it for about maybe three, four years. So it's just before COVID. And feeding, it's got nothing on it back then to what it's got on it now, and especially in that that section between the helipad and the bluff is really up there. Um, yeah. So we'll get into some of these questions because I've got so many questions down here that um, people have asked, and a big one that came through a lot is about lockers. Do you need lockers? Do you need lockers? Do you need lockers far out? Uh, do you need lockers and winches? Um, so we're going to cover some of these, and this one of the guys here, he's asked, you know, do I, do I need a winch and a rear locker to do this track, or could I do it without it? Well, you can do any sort of track without them. Um, you know, again, it all comes down to, you know, your vehicle setup and and your experience. You don't really need lockers or winches to do anything, but they are really handy to have. And, you know, and the thing I find about with having particularly, well, i got front and rear lockers, which I didn't use the front at all in that track. It was just always the rear. And I'll get into that a bit, a bit later in this chat as to why I use the rear. Um, but, yeah, look, rear locker is really handy. You know, it just enables you, especially on this at the moment, really enables you to just, just attack these lumpy sections a lot slower, a bit more controlled. Uh, you're going to get a lot more traction. But again, with a lot more traction, you can break stuff too. So don't think lockers are the be all end all. Like once you get lockers, you can do anything and go anywhere. Well, no, you can't. You can still get in a lot of trouble with lockers. So, you know, you've got to be very careful about just because you think you've got lockers that your vehicle four drive is going to be invincible. No, it's not. Not the case at all. You can fit in and break stuff very easily because now you've got to think there's no slip, there's no give. Once you push those buttons and engage those front or rear lockers, well, that's a solid, solid thing. So there's no give in those wheels. So you can bust axles very, very easily. So I would I would nearly call it, um, again, comes down to your experience, but I would seriously nearly call it, yeah, a rear locker is going to be needed for um, particularly that section we keep talking about between the bluff and the top. Um because, yeah, otherwise, without lockers, you've got to probably punch it a bit harder, got to hit it, hit those lumps a bit harder, a um, bit faster. And then, you know, again, if you've got the experience for that sort of stuff, all well, great. But, um, you know, but doing that, then you've potentially got to, you know, going a bit harder, you're going a bit faster, well, then you've got more chance of breaking stuff. And, geez, this is one track where you don't want to go busting CVs and, and, or any other sort of damage, busting axles, because it's going to be an absolute nightmare to get yourself out of there 
for where it is and, well, cost you big bucks if you've got to get one of those recovery mobs to come and get you. So, and then a winch, you know, if you're going to go with a group, um, I would highly recommend at least one of you has got a winch. Um, a winch is always a great thing. Look, I haven't used my winch in years, fair thing, well, I haven't. And But it's just a nice piece of insurance just to have on the front, just in those off chances that either I might need it or someone else might, I might need to use it for someone else. So a winch is, um, yeah, really handy at the moment. And like, you know, imagine if this guy there the other day that we recovered, imagine if he didn't have a winch on the front of his vehicle. Well, somehow, and he was completely across the track. And we couldn't have driven around him, so we would have had to probably drive up to him on a really nasty section of track, you know, chock the wheels on on the full drive that was going to get up to him and then run a, our own winch up to a tree up the front and then snatch block back and do a two, two, double line pull or something like that to get him straightened up and do the same job that we did, but we used his winch. So having a winch is certainly really handy if you can have one. It just, yeah, it's just a nice piece of insurance to have on the front. And then this one here, um, again, all around rear lockers or... You know, can I drive it in the rig with the most famous Nissan LSD? Well, you know, the L L LSD in the limited slip diff in the rear of the Jeep Troll, yep, it's pretty much a proven thing, and it's going to be certainly a lot better than and uh, not having a locker at all. And so, you know, you're certainly going to get a bit more traction there than having no locker at all with the LSD because they are a pretty damn good thing um, in the back of the Jeep Troll. And, you know, I've talked about this in some of my other videos that, you know, if you're looking to put – lockers in the front of you know, in, in your g patrol well and you can't afford both both ends just do the front because the rear and the LS, the rear end and the lsd in the g patrol is pretty good I'm not sure about other vehicles but yeah the patrol is pretty up there pretty reliable thing so just do the front if you're looking to put one of them in don't touch the back at all and then this one here um oh this one yep yeah, what happens if this one was asked a fair bit about what happens if you get four wheel drives or get a vehicle's coming the other way now, this one's always – I've actually done a video on this one too, a live chat about this on who has right away uh, on some of these tight tracks because fair thing, I mean, it's, it's really tight in some of those sections as you see in that video. And, you know, if you've got a vehicle that's coming the other way, um, what are you going to do? Well, look, generally, the way I sort of look at it, if vehicle's coming down, if they can get off, off the track and let whoever's coming up, you know, give right away, let them keep going, got momentum, let them go and keep going – but it's not going to always work like that because there are sections on that track where you just won't get two vehicles past it, past each other. It's that tight. So somewhere along the line, someone's going to have to back up, whether the one coming down can reverse back to a little spot or the one that's coming up can reverse back to a spot. It's one of those things you have to weigh up at the time as to what you do and how you're going to get past each other safely. So, yeah, that's just something you have to weigh up at the time and make it up when you come to this situation. Now, this one here, this one gets asked a fair bit about too, as I mentioned it in all of my videos, is about the rear locker and why I use lockers all the time. And the reason why I do, because again, when you put a rear locker in the back of a, well, in the back of the GE Patrol, again, the LSD, the limited slip diff, diff center, that comes out. Actually, I've still got it out in the shed out in the back. Um, that comes out and you then your locker mechanism, that goes in its place. So you lose that benefit of that limited slip diff by taking that centre out. Now, without that rear diff engaged, it's it's just a single pegger, single wheeler. So it would break traction very, very quickly and very, very easily um, when, uh, when I don't have that rear locker in. So rather than waiting, especially on a track like that, there's no way I'm going to be waiting until I get myself into trouble or start here and wheel spin and thinking, oh, my God, you know, I've got to hit that button. So I'd just rather have at least the rear engaged all the time. And I pretty much do that from the time I hit, especially in low range, not so much in, in high range if I'm using high range four-wheel drive, but um, in low range four-wheel drive, I pretty much hit that button and lock that rear pretty much from the from the get-go rather than wait for trouble. And I don't use that front until it's really, really needed. You know, you don't want to use – play all your cards at once and have all your locking me mechanisms all locked in when you don't really need them. So, yeah, so that's the main reason, or it is the reason why I um, why I do lock that rear diff every single time from the time I engage low-range full drive because, um, yeah, it would break traction very, very easily. And, yeah, I'm not waiting for that situation to happen, especially on a track like Billy Goat Bluff Track is at the moment. Just, um, yeah, I prefer to lock it in. Um, does Billy Go Bluff Track get managed or, or graded? It does. 
it's been a long time since um, Johnny there. It has been a long time since it's been maintained. Uh, as you can probably imagine, anyone those that have driven it, it would be pretty challenging to run a dozer down it. They wouldn't put a grader down it, but they'd probably get a dozer down it just to knock some of the edges off it, some of those you know, really lumpy sections off it. And it's a wonder they haven't because, of, as I mentioned earlier on in this chat, that there has been um, sort of three, maybe four rollovers on it in the last sort of four to six months. So it's a wonder there hasn't been... Um, something there to, and said we nearly come across number four or five with that bloke the other day. Um, so one, it hasn't been. So I think it's um, it'll probably get done at some stage. But, um, yeah, just waiting for that sort of thing to happen. But, you know, if, if the other thing too with it now in the rain, because there's a lot of um, lot of rocky, it's a lot of rock, hard platform, rocky ledges. So if that was wet, they'd be as slippery as all get up. So that's the other thing you've got to take into account too. If you're looking to go and do it and it's been raining or it is raining, Fetty, you want to really think twice about whether you're going to take on Billy Goat at the moment and um, going up or down. She'd be damn slippery on some of those big rock ledges because that's all they are. Is you know, there's there's not a lot of loose stuff in some of those sections. They're just massive, long, um, lumpy rock, solid rock ledges. But geez, they'd be slippery as all get up if they were wet. Um, Nagas, how you going there, mate? Uh, after some advice on your previous video, I did Billy Goat yesterday, right? I tagged along with another group. I was lucky to find people on AFL day. Um, it was crazy, not safe at all. Well, there you go. That's um, from Nag Naga there. He's um, only did it only yesterday, and yeah, um, it's. I was lucky enough to find find people on AFL, on AFL final day. Yeah, it was crazy. Not safe at all. It is pretty full on, mate. That's what I was mentioning. And this is why we're sort of having this chat about it tonight because um, it is pretty full on. Um, winch cheap insurance saves others putting pressure on other other vehicles yeah, re to recover you. Yeah, look, that's spot on. Look, if you can afford to put a winch on, yeah, I would certainly highly recommend getting one if you can. Um, Nagas, uh, not graded, loose rocks. Yeah, some sections are, and there's, there's still quite a few sections on it. Yeah, that are long, loose, loose, rocky sections, but um, but the bulk of it is those big rocky ledges, solid rock ledges. And look, there's a fair bit of traction in them if you if you got you know right tire pressures, as I mentioned. You know, I ran 18 psi all the way around on all my tires, and yeah, look, they worked an absolute treat. But yeah, some of those sections you feel you can go on, and you just got to keep going. There's no stopping. That's the only thing with going up. You don't have a lot of time to think about what's coming up and what's going on because you're just on it. Um, managed to to put safety some some super sketches here. Yeah. Um, Greg, there so many just so many people with tire pressure too high it makes massive difference lowering them. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Look, I um so many people are too uh, really concerned about you know where they run their tire pressures too low. Um, and I'm, I don't know, I still might play around with some tire pressures even more after with mine because I used to run 20 in the back and then 18 in front was always my go to pressures. But because now I've re removed a lot of weight, you know, over 300 sort of plus kilo I've pulled out of the back patrol, um, yeah, I still might play around a little bit more. I, I potentially could go 16 and 18 or something like that, or I don't know if I'd go much lower than 16 because once you go too low, especially on that track at the moment. Uh, then you start running real risks of popping tyres off beads and then, then you're in a world of trouble if you start popping tyres off beads with too low pressure. So you've got to get your pressures right. But, um, you don't want them too low and you don't want them too high because, you know, going too high, you're going to be bouncing around like all get up and that's when you can, you know, you can do all sorts of other damage to your vehicle and potentially high, you know, popping tyres and bursting tyres and getting punches with too high tyre pressure. There's a really fine line. So you just got to play around with it and, and see what works for your vehicle, you know. Don't go what other someone else says because it mightn't work for your vehicle. But yeah, 18 worked a treat the other day, but I still might potentially play around. We'll see how things go. Um, right at the bottom to the top, very loose rocks due to too many trucks uh, going in, 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 I guess. Yeah, um, it has been chewed up because it does get a lot of, lot of traffic for obvious reasons. Um, I did 18, 20 PSI, like you suggested. Yeah, look, those pressures work well, mate. And, you know, and if you can run those sort of pressures and it works for your vehicle, well, you know, they are, they are good. It does does work well. And, you know, low pressures, they make a massive difference when you get your tyre pressures right. Um, worth mentioning that that old mate stuck on the track wanted wanted us to turn him around so he could drive down. Um, a good, good calm chat on the on the dangers um, with clear mind and, and crucial in the previous situation. I think that's Alan from um, who was with us, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, we we sort of chat, certainly chat with him for a while. We didn't just rush up there and start ripping winches out. We had a chat. We came up with a plan how we were going to sort this guy out. 
um, you know, he was he was out of his vehicle, so that was probably one good thing. And he was fairly calm at the time when we got there. But um, yeah, we we worked out a bit of a plan on what we're going to do, and and then uh, clear communications, you know, using a handheld UHF to chat between myself and the guy that was driving, so he knew what was going on. And um, so yeah, really really good communications and. Yeah, you know, any winching situation, you never ever want to go rushing it, and because um, that's when things go wrong. When you get in there and go gung ho and don't come up with a really solid plan, how you're going to get you, get yourself or get whoever you're trying to recover, get them out. So yeah, take it, take it. Um, yeah, ask Hawley. Yeah, we won't talk about him and tie pressures because he does, doesn't agree with that. Um, status report on the uh, as of 30 September at helipad, very sketchy. Yeah, loose tracks. Um, safe, yeah, not not safe as solo. Look, Billy Goat. Yeah. Um, is not ideal, especially at the moment. Look, I will admit I have driven Billy Goat solo, but um, but yeah, it was nothing like it is at the moment. But yeah, it, like I said, I, I wouldn't be taking on Billy Goat now by myself. It's pretty up there. Um, and then if you get into trouble, you know, on, on that track or any track, you get in trouble on your own, uh, you've got to be really confident about how you're going to get yourself out. You know, can you, you know, recover yourself? And, you know, and the thing is, if you're on your own, you might be able to get out of your full drive. You know, you might have to be sitting in there with all your brakes and everything on. You might not be able to get out. So then how do you operate winches and all this sort of stuff if you've got to do self-recovery? So, yeah, 100%. Never never go on your own and, and just don't do that track right now um, by yourself. Not ideal at all. You're going to get yourself in a world, world of trouble. Um, surprise if it's not seasonally closed. Well, that's the thing, Steve. It's never shut. It's open all year round. Billy Goat's one of those tracks that is not seasonally closed. Um, a few people have asked about that, you know, isn't it closed? But then, no, it's not. It's never never closed, always open all year round. The only time I've seen it closed was a few years ago with the big bushfires because there was fires in the area. So all up through there was all, all shut. That's the only time I've ever seen really Billy Goat closed down. Um, yeah, but at the moment, it's open all year round. Blue Rags, definitely not. It's one of those tracks that's uh, seasonal closed. So it will be open um, just after, or well, just before Cup Weekend. Uh, that's a good point. Where is the nearest seasonal closed gate to Billy Goats? Oh, very good point. There's nothing, nothing. If you if you take Dargo to La Cola, you can drive all the way from Dargo to La Cola without any seasonal gates. Um, that's going up Billy Goat, Maroka Road, Tamaritha Road, down to La Cola, and um, no seasonal gates at all, open all year round, all that whole trip. So, but look, yeah, you just got to know where they are. There, there is a few around, but depending on what what direction you're going to go, but there is a few in that area. You know, you. You know, your Randalls and Conways, they're open all year round. Collingwood's open all year round. They're great tracks. There's still a few there that, you know, open all year round. But when you start going the other way, you know, towards Warren and Gatter, that's when you really start getting into some seasonal closures. You know, your Wombats and Hearn Spurs and all that sort of stuff there, all seasonal shut. So, yeah, you can't go that way at the moment until it until it opens back up. Um, yeah, it will we'll be a matter of time, I think, when they'll seasonally close it. Um, yeah, maybe. It's hard to know. I don't know. I've um I don't know of any any track at this stage. So I might be able to correct me, but I certainly don't know of any that have been not on the seasonal closure list and then all of a sudden been added to it for whatever reasons. So you know who knows they might, but that's the only thing. If if they shut that off, well then yeah, it does it does crop it does cut off that that full access to getting across La Cola. You know, you go to La Cola, you can go to Wahala from Dargo all the way through. No seasonal gates if you know where you got to go. But there is tracks up there that. I've got gates on them, but you can certainly go, yeah, Dargo right through La Cola and across to Walhalla and out through Melbourne that way without any seasonal gate closures, if you know where they are. Um, how does Blue Rag compare to Billy Goat? It's chalk and cheese, not even in the same ballpark um, at the moment. And uh, look, there's really, I mean, yeah, there's a couple of decent sections there on Blue Rag, that long down section and then up the other side but yeah blue rag doesn't even come in the same category as billy goat at the moment it's been come up there uh yeah it's a good drive though look if, if you're up for it like it, we had an absolute ball the crew i went with um you know really confident drivers well set up rigs and we had an absolute ball on it and uh, so you know if you're up for it and you've got the vehicle that's set up for it and um, you know, and you know, your what you're capable of, and you know, you what your full drive's capable of. Um, yeah, it's a great drive, and that's the other thing too. You know, you see so many posts on social media that you know they want to go and drive maybe Billy Goat or whatever other tracks around the high country, and you know they they list 
all the mods on their full drive and then they'll go and say, oh, you know, what do you think? Will that, will that get me up there? And it does my eating too when I, when I see these posts. And and I think to myself, well, who's going to drive this full drive? They don't drive by themselves, you know. You've got to have someone in the cockpit because their full drives – Full drive will only go where you put it, and you know. And if you can pick the right lines and that sort of stuff, well, it'll get up and do the job that it's designed to do. But you know, I don't know of any full drives where you just jump in the in the driver's seat and put your feet up in the dash and it drives by itself. You've got to drive the damn thing. So, and that's what I generally write reply back to some of these comments is um, fair enough. That's what your full drives, you know, all set up like. But what's your experience? And um, and then they generally reply back off that. Um, Because, yeah, it's a two-way thing. It's never about the driver and it's never about just the full drive. It's about both of them and and it's about how well you know yourself, your own limitations and to know what your full drive limitations are. And and that's, you know, that's what you've got to work on. It's got nothing to do with just about what sort of modifications are on your full drive. You know, you can get a really – someone who's, you know, got no idea and chuck them in, say, full drive like mine, very, very capable rig, you know, front and rear lock, reduction gears, the whole bit going on. But it doesn't mean they're going to drive up tracks like Billy Goat just because they're in a very, very capable full drive. So, you know, you've got to know both of them, and that's yourself and your full drive. Do you know the condition of Collingwood at this moment? No, I don't. Um, Johnny, I haven't driven Collingwood again for a few years. Again, good drive. Wouldn't probably take that one on in the wet either. Some of those up sections or that steep sections, whether you're going up or down, would be pretty pretty treacherous in the wet. But, yeah, I'm not really sure at the moment. Mate, I haven't driven that for a, for a little while. Uh, sounds like a good camper trailer in tow. Yeah, that'd be a great idea. Tow a camper up, not. Um, she certainly no. It's no trailer track at all, whether it's in the current condition that it is now or any other time. Um, yeah, Billy Goat's just got danger written all over if you think you're going to tow a trailer up there because, again, you're getting a travel uh, on those long, steep sections with a, with a trailer on the back and then, you know, you're in a world of trouble. So trailer's an absolute no-go zone any time whether it's like it is now or or other times. Um, dropping from 20 to PSI made such a huge difference. It does, mate. It's only 2 PSI, but you wouldn't think 2 PSI would make bug all difference, but it makes a massive difference um, with traction and that sort of stuff. So, you know, if, again, if you're a bit unsure, don't go dropping, you know, too low. Maybe start, of, even 30 is probably too high. You probably start at least maybe around 25 as, a, as an absolute starting point and then work your way from there, see how that goes. Again, depends on what your full drive, what sort of vehicle you got. Whether you got one of these lighter dual cabs, or you got a three-ton vehicle like mine, or a, you know that sort of thing. Well, you know maybe start at your twenty-fives if you're a really bit unsure and see how that goes, and and just let them down in in small increments, drop them down that couple of psi at a time, rather than go from say twenty-five to twenty or those sort of things, and um and see see how that sort of pressures work for you. But um yeah, get your, your temperatures, your um, psi's right, that's for sure. Uh, urban cowboys are always a problem they are, especially on tracks like that. Um, I did downhill as well on 30th. Never will do it again. It's such a status. I was lucky to to come down safe with no issues. Number one rule, guys, prepare your vehicle, uh, I think, 10 times before you pick a line. Yeah. And, you know, and there again, I, I spoke before about which way is easier, going up or which way is going down. Well, there's no easy. doesn't matter which way you're going up or down. They're both very, very challenging, just different challenges. And, you know, they provide different um, obstacles that you've got to deal with at the time, whether you're going up it or you're going down it. Um, but anything going down, you've got a little bit probably more time to think about what's in front of you and what's coming up way down the track. You know, generally you've got a bit more time to look a bit further down the track than what you do when you're going up because, um, yeah, you're on it going up uh what do fly do, uh, tie deflator do i use look i've um i've got those um those ones that pull the inserts out of the out of the uh tire inflator there but i don't know i've gone off them a bit um that uh you know about whether they realign that when you go when you get your pressures right you want to re- screw that inner valve back in again um you know there's always that risk there of whether they don't go in properly or you cross thread them and then you're in all sorts of trouble too so to be fair, I'm honest, oh, I've just gone back to the good old stick. And I used a stick there on Billy Goat Bluff Track the other day. You've got a hand out pressure gauge. And I tell you what, it doesn't take that much longer. And what's the big deal? You know, I'm in, in no rush to go anywhere. But, yep, I just, I'm just i just using a stick um, to <laughs> let my tyre pressures down. And that's what I did. And that's what I'm um, that's what I'm doing at the moment. Good old stick. Can't go wrong. And, uh, yeah, I just put a, got a little gauge there that I'll just check it. Job's done. No worries. 
have you found uh, the traction side traction side of things now that you have reduction gears so much weight out of the old girl um look the reduction gears they're next level amazing things if you can uh, if you're looking to get reduction gears um you know my my first gear before the standard first gear before i put the reduction gears in that's about equivalent to my second gear now and between the bottom and the bluff i was doing most of that in second and third um but those challenging parts of um between the bluff or between the helipad and the top between the bluff i was back in first gear and a lot of that and just crawling up really really nice really slowly um and yeah works an absolute treat um but yeah um tight pressure is about the only thing i might need to maybe play around with just a little bit because of all that extra weight now that i'm not carrying in the back of the old rig um so we'll see what happens with that going forward but yeah reduction gears they're amazing things if you're looking to get them look even coming back down billy goat when we came back down I'm still not using the brakes on any of those sections. For any of you guys that have been down Billy Goat, you know how steep it is and, you know, you know yourself whether you're on brakes or not. Well, I'm still not using brakes coming down any section of that. And there's the guys behind me, you know, I'm, there's some sections I'm even accelerating down down some of those sections on Billy Goat just to keep it moving. That's how low first gear is and it's it's phoenix and wicked um, for coming down. Really slow, controlled, less chance of busting stuff. And so, yeah, first gear is amazing. I really like it. Aussie Tura, thanks very much. Greatly appreciate it. And you're getting some value out of it, mate. Greatly appreciate that. I've um, got a teaser for, for the next video. Come out on, on YouTube. Um, no, I haven't just yet. Oh, I've got one and I'm editing. Um, about some camp lights. A few people have been asking what sort of camp lights I use. So that'll probably be the next one. And then I've uh, yeah, I've got um, a solo location that I'm looking to get done in the next few weeks. Keep that one under the hat, the old hat. Um, but, yeah, I've got a solo location coming up um yeah in the next few weeks to get away and do that so i'm really looking forward to that'll be a great one uh hanging for camp oven cook up yeah i'll have the camp oven all going on haven't done a camp oven cook up for a little while but there'll be one going in that so yeah we'll do some more camp oven stuff uh slow and steady always wins the race when doing billy gates it does mate slow and steady is definitely the way to go whether you're on billy gate or any other track um slow and steady is definitely the way to go now you know some people might think you know because you've got lockers in it takes the fun out of it well i'll tell you what it doesn't and as i said before earlier you know you you can get yourself in a lot of trouble with them as you can without them so you know there's a there's a bit of a bit of a skill thing going on with with learning how to drive um with with lockers in and even with front lockers like when you're front and rear locked in tracks like that feeding it's a whole different ball game because you know, especially with the front locked, you can get thrown sideways and those sort of things. If you're not ready for it, if you start bouncing around, you can break stuff very easily when you start getting airborne and fronts come back down again. Um, yeah, the front end can throw you around a lot, in uh, especially in tracks like that, if you're going too hard at it. So, But, yeah, I was lucky enough. The um, way I was going up, it was going up really good. So front locker was not required, didn't use it at all, which was good. Really happy with that. Um, yeah, slow and steady. So there you go, guys. I think that sort of covers uh, the list that I had sitting over there. Um, but, yeah, lockers was certainly the big one, you know, what uh, whether you need lockers or not to go and do Billy Goat. Well, I'd probably re I'd nearly say you, it would be really good to have them. Um, yeah, it's going to make things a lot easier, a lot more controlled, and otherwise you've got to hit things probably a bit harder and a bit faster without them to get up and over. And even some of the, the wombat holes that I would call them, you know, the cross-ups, you know, to get through those without lockers, yeah, you're probably going to need a fair bit of momentum to get through some of those um, without lockers. So, you know, there, there's sort of certain plenty of advantages with having lockers. So there you go, guys. I think that sort of covers it. Thanks very much, guys, for everyone dropping in there and land tonight and Johnny and Mark. Thanks very much. And uh, all you guys, Philip and, and Biggles is in there somewhere. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much, guys, and we'll catch you next one. That's Billy Goat Bluff Track, all summed up, I hope. If you've got any more questions, chuck them in the comments down below when this is finished, and I'll take care of those. Good on you guys. Really appreciate the feedback. Awesome chat tonight. Absolutely love it. Uru, have a good one. <laughs>